For a time, scientific communication even ceased between the two allies. There was much bitterness, much suspicion, and at least so far as Churchill himself was concerned, much personal anxiety before the terms of that June 42 agreement were further spelled out at Quebec in August 1943, when the separate British endeavour came to an end and the more important British scientists were absorbed into the American effort. For the most significant result of the earlier discussions between the two leaders had been the coming into being of the Manhattan Project, the code name for the American bomb effort, and so called because initially it was begun under the auspices of the Manhattan District of the US Army Corps of Engineers. General Leslie Groves, the man who had built the Pentagon and ahead of schedule, took charge of the project in September 1942. Told it might cost 25 million pounds, the bill he finally presented the American taxpayer was well over 500 million. Groves was a, an impressive person by particularly his courage to take the responsibility for spending vast amounts of money on something that might fail and he would have been blamed if it had failed. Well, General Groves was kind of a teddy bear sort, uh, but every time he'd come around to my laboratory, we'd much amuse the general by burning a piece of concrete with fluorine. He just loved that show. And uh, he had many of the aspects of, uh, of a very intelligent boy. And uh, he was a very stern appearing general and uh, was capable of uh, se severe disciplinary measures. And uh, he got his way without exception. The theoretical work having mostly been done, the major problem was to produce sufficient fissionable material for a bomb. By late 1942, research on three different methods was considered far enough advanced to justify attempting large-scale production. But because it was not so much backing the best method as backing the fastest, in typical American fashion, the decision was taken to go ahead with all three, despite the enormous cost that would entail. Two of them, under Nobel Prize winners Ernest Lawrence of Berkeley, California, the inventor of this, the cyclotron, and Harold Urey of Columbia, New York, involved separating U-235 by the so-called electromagnetic and gaseous diffusion methods. The third, under the direction of yet another Nobel Prize winner, Arthur Compton of Chicago, was to produce plutonium by graphite reactor. Plutonium was an entirely new fissionable material indeed a new element altogether, which had been discovered almost simultaneously on both sides of the Atlantic by scientists researching the bomb, though much the greater work on it had been carried out by future Nobel Prize winner Glenn Seaborg. The crucial thing about plutonium was not just that you needed less for a chain reaction than U-235, but that it seemed easier to obtain. The sample that was isolated as a result of uh, bombarding these hundreds of pounds of uranium with neutrons at Berkeley and, and St. Louis, was finally isolated in pure enough form to weigh a few micrograms by a special balance in which a quartz fiber is suspended at one end and comes out with a weighing pan hanging from that end. And then the sample put on that weighing pan depressed the quartz fiber and the amount that the quartz fiber went down could be calibrated to correspond to the weight of the sample. And using that, the first sample of plutonium was found to weigh 2.77 micrograms. 2.77 micrograms was less than a millionth of an ounce, while the amount needed for a bomb was a billion times that. Compton was convinced, though, that he could produce the necessary plutonium. The scheme to make the world's first atomic pile for producing plutonium was devised by two brilliant refugee members of Compton's team, Enrico Fermi, the gentle Italian Nobel Prize winner whose wife was Jewish and hence a potential victim of fascist persecution, and Leo Szilard, Hungarian, Jewish, volatile, vain, impetuous, above all, imaginative. Between them, they prepared to make history in a disused rackets court beneath the stands of the University of Chicago's football stadium at Stagg Field. The US Army should have completed a new laboratory for them on the outskirts of Chicago, but had been beset by labor troubles. Compton and co. were too impatient to wait, for rumor had reached them that the authorities were having second thoughts and were considering dropping their method of making material for a bomb to concentrate on the other two. Even so, their decision to risk a chain reaction in the middle of heavily populated Chicago sent General Groves, for one, into a paddy. 
The idea of a pile was to avoid having to separate the U-235 by simply having a big enough block of uranium that there would be sufficient U-235 already in it to start a chain reaction. To get the necessary uranium, in Canada, the only significant uranium mine in the Western Hemisphere was reopened. But there was still the problem of refining the uranium to the necessary purity for an atomic pile. At Iowa State University, Frank Spedding, a chemist, came up with a new way of producing the metal, albeit a somewhat crude and ramshackle way with its rough retorts and heavy ingots. But, miraculously almost, it worked. There was a great deal of curiosity on the campus as to what we were doing, particularly as we once in a while one of our retorts would blow up and with the magnesium, which is what you use in flash powder, it would light up the whole building and it gave a uh, illusion uh, it was the light was so bright that the building swelled up and then sunk back. And the press, the college press office was right across the street from this building. So naturally their curiosity was very great, but nobody would talk, so they didn't know what was going on. 50 tons of uranium went into the pile and 400 tons of graphite. The 50 tons broken down into 22,000 individual uranium slugs and the 400 tons of graphite sawed and planed and drilled into 40,000 bricks for stacking. Few photographs were taken of that historic occasion, but the artist John Cadell captured the scene for posterity. Graphite was being received from several manufacturers. And this material, uh, when it arrived, was in rather uh, unusable form. And we set up uh, a machining facility. Uh, the word facility is a little bit uh, grand for what we had. We, we put some machines and some ventilation into a, a room in the squash court and proceeded to uh, square up the bars and cut them to the right length. I remember one night when we were pushing these things we used just ordinary woodworking tools, you see, and we were pushing these through the shop, through the planer. And here was Enrico Fermi, stripped to noise, pushing these graphite blocks through the, through the uh, shaper. Just glistened, absolutely black, clear to his waist. Well, they're just throwing graphite dust in every direction, you know. He could have had a part in Othello, December the 2nd, 1942, was a cold winter's day and the central heating had been switched off under the stands of the football stadium. With the pile now completed, Fermi ordered the test to begin. Inch by inch, the control rods separating the bits of uranium from each other were withdrawn and the noise of the Geiger counters rose. Near the rail by Fermi's side stood Norman Hilbury with his axe ready to cut the rope holding the safety rod. Quite frankly, it never occurred to me that the act would really have to be sworn. Any more than I am sure it ever occurred to Al Graves and company that they would ever throw these damn bottles down because they saw some glow. The damn bottles were full of a special solution to flood the pile and stop the reaction if it got out of control. The last words Fermi said to him was, now if this is a final emergency. If the thing gets away from us, you're to break this. But he said, I want you to know that you're to watch me, and if I drop dead, then you're to break it. If I'm alive, I'll, <laughs> I'll use this ledge hammer on you. <laughs> certain point, the safety uh, circuits, which had been set to a, to a certain maximum flux, began to uh, give a, a bell signal, and that so people wanted still to go a little higher, so they simply pulled the wires off the bell signal so it wouldn't ring. <laughs> Went a little higher, and then Enrico said, put the control rods in. But it was quite clear it was uh, the answer of everyone's hopes and dreams. There was absolutely dead silence. Nobody said anything. I'm sure everyone was thinking immediately ahead to the bomb.
but General Groves hadn't waited for the result of the test pile before commissioning the construction of a full-scale plant for producing plutonium. And I told Compton that the only one that I knew of that could do the job was DuPont. And I talked to the DuPont people, and it was arranged. Well, uh, I must say that this whole field was so new to us uh, and so strange that we weren't sure whether these people were crazy or whether they weren't. Uh, it was uh, completely unprecedented. The site chosen for the plutonium plant was here at Hanford in the state of Washington, a sandy wasteland on the barren banks of the great majestic Columbia River. Half a million acres were allotted for the plant, and it was to be the biggest construction project in United States history. For as well as a production complex, there was a whole new town to be built too. 50,000 men were recruited for the task. Few, very few were told what they were actually making. The construction camp was the largest the West had ever seen. It was also one of the roughest. The plant's purpose was to produce plutonium, a mineral that no one had ever seen and whose properties were still unknown. To date, only millionths of an ounce had been obtained in the laboratory, whereas the task now was to produce many, many pounds perhaps the greatest scale-up ever attempted by chemists and engineers. Although the men, and women of course, working at Hanford, came from almost every state in the Union, people from two states were specifically barred, Tennessee and New Mexico. In their near obsession with security, the US Army Corps of Engineers feared that residents from these two states going to Hanford might see a link between what was happening there and what was already emerging on two other sites, in Tennessee and New Mexico. For at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, between the Great Smoky Mountains and the Cumberland Plateau, on a 54,000-acre plot, another new township and vast, sprawling production complex was beginning to take shape, this time for the separation of U-235. Described by some as the most fantastic technological facility ever devised by man, the amount of electricity needed for just one of the Oak Ridge plants was more than that used by cities the size of Boston, USA, or Birmingham, England. Everything was on a gigantic scale. The electromagnets to separate the U-235 were a hundred times bigger than any previously known. When it was discovered there wasn't enough copper to service them, pure silver bullion was used instead. 15,000 tons of it, borrowed by the army from the US Treasury for the war's duration. The floor of just one of the buildings covered 44 acres of ground and was four stories high. Needless to say, it was the largest building ever constructed. The uh, development of an industry the size of Detroit in two years was what we accomplished. And uh, it is almost unbelievable, but it happened. Research hitherto had been concentrated on producing the fissionable materials for a bomb. As yet, no one was working on the physical problems of actually making a bomb. Indeed, making a bomb was not strictly within General Grove's brief. In the autumn of 1942, a colleague of Ernest Lawrence's at Berkeley, California, persuaded Groves to set up a separate bomb laboratory at some remote spot. His name was J. Robert Oppenheimer and his of all was the name destined to be most linked with the atom bomb story. Groves had wanted Oppenheimer to lead the bomb laboratory from the start, but the FBI refused to give him a security clearance on account of his having associated with left-wingers in the 30s. In the end, Groves took it on himself to clear Oppenheimer, and to go on clearing Oppenheimer, even when the FBI came up with what they claimed was new evidence of his continuing associations with communists, a gesture which after the war brought Groves much criticism in certain quarters of American life. Even today, Oppenheimer remains a controversial figure, an enigma to many. Gentle, sort of the philosopher type, always thinking rather than doing things. But nevertheless, he had also a very great strength of character, and the main thing was that scientists trusted him. Oppenheimer was highly respected by most people, and or proved to be a, a marvelous director of a place like that. He managed to uh, keep the confidence of all the people there, managed to keep them together, and also to handle the army uh, side of things. The scientists and the army were not always easily compatible. <laughs> 